Hello and welcome to episode 66 of Glitch Report. My name is Nitwit. I am filling in for this week's show. Your regular host could not make it, so uh, Nitwit is here to save the day. We're going to talk all things video game news and just video games. A whole lot of video games. You know, we're not here to talk about... Um, we're not here to talk about uh, cars... We're not here to talk about uh, automobiles, and I say automobiles and cars because I was referring to the hit Disney Pixar movie Cars when I said we're not going to talk about it. So take your Lightning McQueen fandom and get the fuck out of here. We're not here to talk about any of that shit. We're here to talk about video games. So in fairness, they did make a couple of Cars games. If I was familiar with them, maybe I'd have something to say, but I don't. Instead, we're going to talk all things news, uh, some huge news, including a returning segment that I like to call shit I should have talked about last week. Uh, I forgot to talk about some news, some big news last week, so we'll talk about that. And of course, the games that I've been playing, things that we can expect on the horizon. I have a little bit of a sore throat, I apologize. I don't know what it is, I, I couldn't tell you. I Maybe I've been partying, maybe I've been drinking too much, maybe it's both. Though the sad thing is, is that sometimes when I'm drinking, I'm not even partying. We're not here to talk about my demons and my vices. We're here to talk about video games, which in fairness, I mean, one could assume that uh, if you did a podcast about video games, you might have an unhealthy relationship with video games because how could you seriously sit here and talk about video games, you know, for hours, uh, you know, at a time, week upon week upon week. But that's, that's what I'm here to do. And uh, you can't yuck my yum. That's what I say. Huge week for games. Um, we got Marvel's Spider-Man 2 and Super Mario Bros. Wonder, just to name a few of the big releases out this week. And I figured we would, you know, kick things off kind of talking about uh, the reviews for those games. First and foremost, I want to just say, um, I had put Marvel's Spider-Man 2 up as uh, one of my most anticipated games of this year. However... I'm not in a position to play that game myself because as of right now, it is only available on PlayStation 5 and I am but a humble PC player for the most part. That being said, I did play Marvel's uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales on PC and that is an excellent game. And I, I would still stand by my belief that Miles Morales is a significantly better game than the original uh, Marvel's Spider-Man. That being said, Marvel Spider-Man 2 might be taking the crown as the best Spider-Man game to date. Currently, over at uh, OpenCritic.com, it is sitting at a 91 out of 100, with a 100% of all critics recommending the game. That is an average score of 91 out of 107 reviews. So, hey, turns out, game's doing pretty well. Um, Eurogamer, giving it a 4 out of 5. Saying, at once a little simple and a little overstuffed, Marvel Spider-Man 2 is still above all a game of immense charm and fluid free-form style. IGN giving it an 8 out of 10, saying Marvel Spider-Man 2 delivers Insomniac's best tale yet, and despite its open world falling short, is a reliably fun superhero power trip. Uh, game Informer, 9.5 out of 10. Saying Insomniac has nailed that rarest of video game development feats. A team has landed a trilogy of games that all stand strong on their own merits, but unite into a sweeping saga made better by experiencing it its uh, by experiencing its entirety. While more Spider-Man games will inevitably expand this mythology in new directions, there's no need to wait. With Spider-Man 2, the developer has found what makes superhero stories worth telling and retelling. And given its likable heroes the journey they deserve. I guess I guess you could consider this a trilogy of games. And, and, and I'm not like trying to downplay Miles Morales or anything like that, but I never thought like Yeah, I guess my you know Marvel Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and Spider-Man 2 is a trilogy of games. Because I can't imagine a lot of people are getting into Spider-Man 2 having not played Miles Morales. And again, like I would almost argue 
you could skip Spider-Man 1. You probably can't. Some people are going to say, Nitwit, you're crazy. What are you talking about? That's like saying you can get into Batman Arkham City having never played Arkham Asylum. Yada, yada, yada. I get it. Um, I just really like Miles Morales. And I'm excited to see, you know, Spider-Man 2 doing so well. You know, in Marvel Spider-Man 2, you are playing as both Peter Parker and Miles Morales. Um, switching kind of between them, you know, seamlessly the way that, um, you seamlessly swap between, uh, Trevor, Michael, and, um, uh, who the hell's the other guy? Trevor, Michael, and, um, oh my god, I am blanking on the protagonists of, uh, uh, Franklin. Franklin, uh, Trevor, Michael, and Franklin. The way you seamlessly tra uh, transition between playing as Trevor, Michael, and Franklin in something like a GTA 5, you're doing that between Peter and Miles Morales in Spider-Man 2. Uh, GameSpot, 8 out of 10. Marvel Spider-Man 2 delivers an incredible story about heroes and villains grappling with loneliness. And, um, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, Positive reviews, you know, from from around. Some companies don't do scores for these games. They just, you know, they don't do scores for whatever reason. I get it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Ars Technica, more of the same is just fine when it's more of this compelling superhero formula. Buy it. So, looking pretty good for uh, uh, Spider-Man 2. Uh, also looking very good. The reviews for Super Mario Brothers Wonder. I don't even have. I don't have my Switch. I need to actually go get my. I have a. My Nintendo Switch is over at a friend's house, so I couldn't even be playing uh, Mario Brothers Wonder if I wanted to. But I do because the reviews for it have been incredibly positive. Ninety-two out of a hundred, with a ninety-eight percent critics recommended, and that is out of fifty-eight uh, reviews. Over at OpenCritic.com, Eurogamer, 5 out of 5. An endless cascade of ideas in a game that takes Mario to wonderfully strange places. A GameSpot, 9 out of 10. This is the rightful successor to Super Mario World and hopefully will serve as a touchstone for 2D Mario games going forward. A Destructoid, 9 out of 10, Super Mario Bros. Wonder is the first Mario game in literal decades to live up to the plumber's legendary 2D platforming legacy. It is a return to levels overflowing with creativity, a world rich with secrets to uncover, and controls that make the mere act of movement fun. Whether Wonder exceeds or meets the quality of Super Mario Bros. 3 or World is for fans to debate. But that aside, I'm confident in saying that Mario's latest adventure is one of the best side-scrollers you'll find on the Switch. Long live 2D Mario. Yeah, that's... Um, I am looking for a wonderful and strange Mario game. Like, I want something that has, uh, you know, a little bit of stank to it. Something that's a little weird. Something that's a little out there. Because I feel like... Mario is at its best when they throw away a lot of your preconceived notions of what Super Mario can be. And look, man, I mean, Super Mario's been around for a long ass time. That dude is old as hell. His ability to run and jump for an old man is incredibly impressive, right? So if you think about the Mario Brothers Wonder as... You know, them, again, them throwing away a lot of the tradition, um, them throwing away a lot of preconceived notions, and then you look at the Mario movie, and it's a celebration of what Mario has been up until now, and, and probably will forever be, you can see, you know, Nintendo really actually being able to have their cake and eat it too in this scenario of like, hey, if you've been playing Mario for a long time, great, this is a, you know, this is Mario as you know and love him but maybe the best 2D Mario he's ever been. And then for people who are maybe newer to Mario or haven't kept up with it, watch something like the movie and you'll be like, ah, yes, this is Mario as I've always remembered him, right? And I'm not saying that Mario Brothers Wonder and uh, the movie can't coexist. I think it's actually beautiful that they do because it, I think it serves fans uh, like myself, if I can be selfish for a moment, service fans like myself who want to both celebrate the past of Mario, but also look to the future for something a little bit out there and a little bit different. 
So that's our kind of review roundups for Marvel, Spider-Man 2, and Super Mario Brothers Wonder. I mean, there are other games coming out uh, this week, um, but it seems like between PlayStation fans and uh, Nintendo fans, there is a lot to look out for uh, th this week especially. And, um, you know, I, I listen, I want to play... I want to play both those games, <laughs> to be honest. I want to play... I want to play everything that uh, is available, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have a PS5, and I don't have my Switch uh, at this very moment. If we look at, you know, kind of other releases uh, for for this week, it is uh, Thursday, October 19th. Oh, right, that King Kong Skull Island game came out. That game's supposed to be a uh, horrific uh, piece of shit. Maybe we'll we'll talk about that next week. Um, oh yeah, Hot Wheels uh, Unleashed 2 Turbo Charge, uh, Turbo Charged is out today uh, on pretty much everything. You know, I wasn't very impressed with what I played of Hot Wheels Unleashed, the uh, Uno, on a hot, the first Hot Wheels Unleashed game. Um, that being said, you know, hey, if they're going to take another crack at it with a sequel, maybe it's better. Maybe they improve on a lot of that stuff. I really couldn't tell you. But that is also out as well. And then uh, Mario's, Mario's actually out tomorrow. Mario and Spider-Man are out Friday, October 20th. Um, so, hey, good news. The reviews are out prior to the game coming out, and they're uh, terrific uh, review scores across the board. All right, let's get into news. I don't know if you've heard. Activision is buying... Uh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard. Activision is not buying Microsoft. Microsoft is buying Activision Blizzard. And it has officially been completed. We can finally stop talking about it after this episode of the podcast. Though I imagine there'll be plenty more, um, you know, new stories to go uh, from here on out. But basically, long story short, Microsoft has officially completed its acquisition of Activision Blizzard. They also put out a trailer for it. It's on YouTube. It's, it's available everywhere. I briefly watched this and i really didn't like it i thought it was just kind of like emotionally manipulative and weird and just you know it's like oh here's the world of you know here's call of duty with master chief with the crash bandicoot with spyro and it's like you know what it made me realize if we just pause for a moment um when i think about iconic Microsoft characters, of course, prior to the purchase of Activision Blizzard, when I think about iconic uh, Activision, uh, sorry, uh, when I think about iconic uh, Microsoft characters, really the only one that comes to mind is Master Chief. And Master Chief, in the grand scheme of things, if you if you remove Master Chief from Halo, he's like the least important part of Halo, man. Like, he's just... Uh, He's just a guy who goes from A to B shooting the Covenant and, and the Flood and things like that in Halo. Like, I really don't consider Master Chief to be much of a um, a character in the grand scheme of things. When I see Master Chief, I don't think, oh, I love that guy. I think, oh, Master Chief, I really like Halo. And, and of course, you know, some people might say the same thing about, you know, Nathan Drake. When they see Nathan Drake... They don't think of the man, the character. They think about Uncharted. They think about, you know, climbing and shooting and puzzles and, and, and all that stuff. But um, I feel like, you know, despite owning Activision Blizzard, Microsoft still lacks a significant amount of iconic characters. So to make this trailer... Um, go watch the trailer. Make make your own form your own opinion. Don't just take it from me. But to to have this trailer that focuses on iconic characters, like even with this sixty nine billion dollar deal, they do not have the characters that Nintendo has. They don't have the characters that that Sony has. In in all honesty, I feel like if you were to, especially when you consider, you know, Spider Man, is uh is a PlayStation guy, you know, right? Um, Aloy, uh, Joel, Ellie, uh, and I know that they, those are like very, like Joel and Ellie especially are very human characters, right? They're not this badass space marine like, uh, you know, uh, Master Chief is, right? They're not superheroes the way that, um, you know, Spider-Man is, right? But, uh, Aloy from, 
uh, from the Horizon games, uh, Kratos, right? I mean, I feel like just those few characters alone just blow everything uh, that uh, My uh, Microsoft now owns from an iconic character standpoint out of the water. And that's even taking into account that they own Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. I mean, you know, <laughs> even though Microsoft now owns Tony Hawk himself, I, I just... The, the 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 trailer is very weird and and if you get the chance to watch it please go ahead but like who's sitting here being like ah oh, yes the iconic characters of call of duty like you're just a man with a gun who might die in you know middle of the story and then switch to a different character in uh call of duty and that's not a spoiler for uh a particular uh, Call of Duty story. That's a spoiler for damn near every uh, Call of Duty campaign. And that's fine. I mean, those ga those games are great, and they're they're Michael Bay ask blockbuster rides. But no one comes to Call of Duty for its characters, and if they do, good on them. Um, there's other good games out there with better characters. So that trailer is weird, but of course, you know, um, Microsoft is out there pounding its chest, very excited. Um, about the future of this uh, of this relationship of this ownership, I should say. Uh, I believe this is uh, one Uncle Phil, uh, Phil Spencer, out there talking that shit, saying, uh, "quote As one team, we'll learn, innovate, and continue to develop, uh, continue to deliver on our promise to bring the joy and community of gaming to more people." He also added, "We'll do this in a culture that strives to empower everyone to do their best work." where all people are welcome and is centered on our ongoing commitment of gaming for everyone. We are intentional about inclusion in everything we do at Xbox from our team to the products we make and the stories we tell to the way our players interact and engage as a wider gaming community. Together, we'll create new worlds and stories, bring your favorite games to more places so more players can join in, and we'll engage with the delight, uh, we'll engage with and delight players in new innovative ways in the places they love to play, including mobile, cloud streaming, and more. I mean, this is, you know, it's vague, it's it's a victory lap, so to speak, but like, hey, in, in all fairness, like, Microsoft, Activision, and Blizzard have slowly started uh working towards that i mean you know diablo now out on steam tony hawks uh pro skater uh one and two remastered uh now out on steam so you know we're getting there though in fairness there wasn't a huge dump of uh activision games on game pass uh word around town uh, from Xbox is uh, don't expect that to come out this year. They're looking to starting starting to put out those uh, Activision games on Game Pass uh, sometime in 2024. And I guess like that's where the rubber meets the road, at least for me personally, is like in in 2024, am I going to be able to play through like damn near every Call of Duty campaign? I, I'm not here to talk shit about Call of Duty campaigns. Like I genuinely enjoy them, and I'd be even willing to replay some of them because they're, you know, relatively short, bombastic experiences. But uh, am I going to be able to sit down and play through like every almost every Call of Duty campaign? Am I going to be able to, you know, play uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater One and Two Remastered on uh, on Game Pass? Right. What about the Crash games? What about the Spyro games? What about fucking gun are they gonna put gun on game pass put gun on game pass cowards that's what the people want they want to play gun forget fucking playing red dead redemption one or two when we talk about the greatest can't say it with a straight face um when we talk about the greatest western game of all time we're talking about gun baby uh and 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 everything else right i mean Activision owns a whole lot of shit. They weren't doing anything. Are we going to get a new guitar hero? Right? I don't know. I have no idea. Right? They, they, you know, they're, they're keeping their cards very close to their chest prototype. I, I'll just keep naming games. Uh, you know, that, that Activision Wolfenstein game that, um, you know, Raven or Raven going to be able to make a sequel to singularity. So on and so forth. Right? So, 
I don't know. We'll f- we'll find out. You know, you know as much as me when it comes to what to expect from Xbox and uh, Microsoft at this point in time, uh, as relates to uh, putting these you know Activision and Blizzard games out on you know platforms like Game Pass, like Steam, things like that. Right. So we shall see. But it has happened. It is over. Sixty eight point seven billion dollars. Now there's. A little more news to this, and then maybe we'll stop talking about it. People are starting to suspect, and by people I mean analysts, industry analysts are expecting that uh, the ball is now in Sony's court to react to Xbox's uh, purchase of Activision. Now keep in mind that, uh, you know, Sony has thrown around some money as of late. They purchased uh, Destiny developer Bungie. For $3.6 billion um, last July, which was uh, the, the one of the Japanese company's largest acquisitions to date. But uh, other people are thinking that, you know what, it might be time for Sony to, uh, you know, cough up a little bit more dough, make another purchase here and there, right? Is, is Capcom for sale? Is Konami for sale? Um who who else is available to to be bought at the, at this at these sort of you know earth shaking scales? But um, that would be a bit of a downer. Microsoft is a much bigger company than Sony, in like every sense of the word, right? Like sixty eight point seven billion dollars seems like a lot of money, and I'm not saying it's not, but it's not that much money in the grand scheme of things compared to my, you know compared to what Microsoft has going on, right? Sony, on the other hand, like they could, they could never cop up $68.7 billion, even if they wanted to, even if they wanted to, they couldn't do it. So what I want to just say before we get into this is just keep in mind that if Sony was to react and make another big purchase, you know, even on the level of something like a Bungie, they cannot go blow for blow financially with Microsoft, right? You know, and, and I think you see that in their approach to to gaming right sony wants that money up front they're going to charge you full price for spider-man right spider-man is a 90 dollar canadian 90 dollar game right now hey turns out that spider-man 2 is a fucking fantastic game people love it it's a you know you can put 20 plus hours into it and have a terrific time i don't know how long spider-man um 2 is but you know, with it being open world and all the side content and the story, like probably looking at at least 20 ish, you know, 25 plus hours. But also on top of that, Sony's guaranteeing, yo dog, this game is fucking fantastic. Spider-Man two poised to be one of the best games of 2023. The catch it's going to cost you $90 to play it. Now again, $90 Canadian. And that's because they, might not be able to afford to put it out on something like PlayStation plus. Like we talk about how man PlayStation plus needs to have a better offerings. And like, I'm not here to to dispute that. I'm just saying that, you know, while Sony could probably tighten up the window of when games come to PlayStation plus, I don't think they could afford to have Spider-Man day one because the biggest acquisition they were able to make in recent history was uh, dwarfed by uh, Microsoft's recent history of, of purchases, right? Um, media uh, researchers, uh, senior games analyst, Carol uh, uh, Severin said he thought it was unlikely Sony would respond by buying a leading third-party publisher on the scale of Rockstar owner Take-Two which has a market capitalization of $24.6 billion. So think about that. That is, uh, that's pretty small in comparison to, to Activision Blizzard's deal. And Sony might not even be able to afford that. However, analysts are suggesting that Sony could attempt to capitalize on its strength across film, TV, games, and music by launching a new cross entertainment subscription offering. Um, I'm just going to say right now that subscriptions are, it, subscriptions are a bubble waiting to burst. It seems like every month Netflix is more expensive. 
every month. They're putting out, you know, new subscription offerings to compete with Paramount Plus, to compete with Peacock, to compete with, you know, uh, Prime, to compete with Disney and all this shit. And then you can't share your passwords and all this shit. I don't know if, you know, PlayStation 5 gamers necessarily care about all of Sony's TV and film offerings they and or their music. You know what I mean? So I don't know if a cross entertainment subscription offering is going to be able to compete with having call of duty on game pass. You see what I'm getting at? Like, do you see like they're one's playing checkers, the other's playing chess and, and you know what? It's fine. I'm not going to tell you that like, you know, in, in 10, 10 years, Sony's going to have the market capital of something like, like, uh, like Microsoft. Um, however, you know, People are are saying like, you know, Sony has one of the most impressive content catalogs on earth, bringing it together in a subscription offering, for example, could pose a solid competitive answer to Xbox cross-platform efforts. I would argue that you could just start with improving PlayStation Plus, but I, I just don't know, right? Like if, if Sony were to completely revamp their PlayStation Plus offering or include PlayStation Plus in a cross entertainment subscription service, are we looking at like a $30 a month deal? Like, am I, am I just a Sony household at that point? Because I cannot afford that and Netflix, that and Disney. I just don't see a world in which Sony buys a company on the size of, of Activision uh, Blizzard anytime soon. But I do suspect that Sony will continue to make great games like Spider-Man 2 uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, but it would be reasonable to expect that, you know, Sony would have to cook up something to compete uh, with this deal. And, and, and I say that, you know, recognizing that so Sony is number one in this console race. If you don't count Nintendo, if you don't count Nintendo, Sony is, you know, blowing, uh, you know, Microsoft out of the water when it comes to, a sales of of games um, and sales of consoles. Now, in fairness, Xbox doesn't necessarily care about selling games because they have Game Pass. So again, I just want to stress that like analysts are expecting Sony to do this and do that and whatever, but one's playing checkers, the other's playing chess, and um, you could argue that one game is more successful than the other, but uh, you might not be able to... Like, I don't f expect... And I know this sounds fucking crazy considering they just did this. But I don't know if Xbox is going to be able to produce a game that gets review scores as high as Spider-Man 2 for some time. It could happen. I would love to be wrong. And I'm not here to say that, like, you know, they can't spend their way to having a, a higher review score than, like, an 8 out of 10 or something. 7 out of 10. Uh, for some of their games. But, man... Sony, when they put out a game, it's fucking killer. And when Xbox puts out a game, it's good for the most part, not counting Redfall. <laughs> you see what you see what I'm getting at? You see what I'm saying, man? All right. I think that's uh, I think that about wraps it up. One last little bit of uh, Xbox uh, news, this time uh, related to Bethesda and not Activision Blizzard. Uh, but this is head of publishing. Pete Hines is leaving after 24 years and going back to our conversation around like Jim Ryan and stuff like that. Um, there was a time in the game industry when you didn't need to have a charming or charismatic, uh, talking head for your company, because when these companies met with people for press conferences, or, you know, announcements, they were very business focused. They were very like, we're going to look at sales graphs and charts and, uh, you know, bar graphs, pie charts, you line graphs, you name it. Very business focused. And then I would say in the last 10 or so years, it became much more personality focused and you could, you could obviously see that with the rise of, of YouTube and, uh, and, uh, and Twitch streamers and influencers and, and all of that stuff. But at some point, you know, you needed a, you know, uh, 
you know, a charming, you know, charismatic figure to go out on stage and announce the next fallout game. You needed, um, somebody to get the crowd hyped for kingdom hearts three, whatever the case is, uh, to announce uh, a new, um, you know, PlayStation, you know, announce a PlayStation four, something like that. And, um, that's where I feel like Jim Ryan wasn't the greatest guy for that. And I'm not here to sit and to sit here and tell you that like Pete Hines was the best at it, but I kind of liked Pete Hines, you know, I thought he had some, uh, the thing I remember about Pete Hines was the way that him and Bethesda approached marketing, um, Wolfenstein, uh, specifically the, the, the most recent, no, not the most recent, the second Wolfenstein game, um, the old Colossus, the new world. Wolfenstein. I mean, I mean, he was, he was around for publishing almost all of, um, you know, those Wolfenstein games, uh, not just, uh, the new order and stuff like that. Um, but it was specifically around 2017 when, uh, Wolfenstein Two: the new Colossus was coming out and, and Pete Hines and Bethesda were out there kind of marketing that game. And they were just like, yo dog, shooting Nazis is good. Like shooting Nazis is a great thing for the world. <laughs> I'm maybe like paraphrasing a little bit, but they were basically just out there being like, yo dog, fuck these Nazis, shoot them in our video game. It's awesome. And I was like, that video game basically just sells itself at that point. Right. Uh, if you are going to have over the top first person shooter action and it feels like like good in the in the soul to shoot uh scumbags like uh like Nazis it's it's great and, and they were you know they were kind of dancing around the issue but like e even going back and I, and I hate to make this a political thing but I will um look at the world around us today and we've seen a rise of of you know anti-semitism we've seen a rise in in um, white supremacy, we've seen a rise in, in neo Nazis and, and and all sorts of shit all over the world, and uh, and maybe the world made it easy for people like Pete Hines and 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 companies like Bethesda to market games like you know the Wolfenstein Two, the New Colossus, by being just shitty, awful places. But when Bethesda took the ball and ran with it. And Pete Himes was out there tweeting about shooting Nazis and stuff. I was like, yeah, like this is all right. This game is pretty good too. And I'm excited for it anyways, but this is a good way um, to market it. Now, Pete Hines um, says that uh, he's got, he got a couple statements and we'll read them. This is from uh, our man, Pete Hines. After 24 years, I've decided my time at Bethesda Softworks has come to an end. I am retiring and will begin an exciting new chapter in my life, exploring interests and passions, donating my time where I can and taking more time to enjoy life. This is not a decision I came to easily or quickly, but after an amazing career culminating in an incredible launch in the incredible launch of Starfield, it feels like the time is right. He added, this is certainly not a goodbye by any means. My love of Bethesda and its people have never wavered and I will never stop being part of the incredible community we have grown. Thank you to the hundreds and thousands of fans I've gotten to meet and talk to over the last 24 years. Your energy, creativity, and support has been a big part of my journey. I look forward to experiencing the next part of the adventure alongside you. Um, Bethesda also put out a statement uh, talking about Pete Hines. Um, keep in mind that, you know, Pete Hines is also part of that, uh, you know, Zenimax media, you know, purchase. Uh, by Microsoft in 2021. So there's every possibility that Pete Hines kind of needed to stay around for a little bit to uh, finish up uh, his contract with Microsoft. But 24 years, that's a, that's a pretty decent run. And uh, like I said, I liked Pete Hines. Pete Hines was all right. Um, unfortunately, it feels like a lot of my favorite, uh, you know, kind of games... Uh, you know, figureheads, uh, figureheads in gaming. You think about a Reggie fils from a Nintendo, a Wada, of course, a Wada, one of the goats, as far as I'm concerned, uh, from Nintendo. Um, 
Andrew House, Adam Boys. Uh, the uh, the Adam Boys is still around, uh, just not you know maybe his front and center. I feel like a lot of these guys are kind of getting out of games and and leaving and stuff like that, and it's and it's unfortunate. Um, I like you know we talk about Phil Spencer a lot. I like Phil Spencer. Xbox has a huge amount of work ahead of them to right a lot of wrongs and sixty nine billion dollars and purchasing you know Bethesda isn't going to to undo the damage that has been done to that brand to that legacy of gaming uh especially all the goodwill that they uh built up with the xbox 360 but when i see phil spencer on stage i'm like this guy's all right this guy seems cool i would maybe have a beer with this guy uh and uh pete hines seemed like an all right guy as well so i wish you know everyone involved the 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 best of luck in in that you know not only uh transition of power but of whatever pete gets up to seems like getting out of games but um if i know one thing about uh you know people in the video game industry it's that uh some don't stay retired for long some never really retire so we'll see what uh is in store for pete hines i don't expect pete hines to retire like 15 times like rick flair or something but um you know Maybe he sticks around in games in a much smaller and less public capacity. Another week, another news story about Embracer Group Studios getting laid off. This time it is pinball FX maker Zen Studios losing 32 of its employees at the Hungarian studio. You know, we talked about it. Saudi Arabia had a $2 billion deal going with um, Embracer Group. That didn't work. Deal fell through. Layoffs have been happening left, right, and center, including Gearbox, Publishing, Crystal Dynamics, and uh, Knights of the Old Republic studio Beamdog. They also closed down Volition. They are considering selling Borderlands maker Gearbox entirely. Shit has not been good at Embracer Group for a very long time. And I just hope that this madness comes to an end eventually with the good people working on these games, landing at their feet. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes to pinball games, uh, the Zen Studio stuff is some of my least favorite stuff. And, I'll, and the, one of the reasons for that is because they are making new tables. They are fake. They're fake tables. They're not emulating adam's family they're not you know emulating twilight zone they're not emulating um real you know pinball tables they're instead making pinball tables from nothing from scratch you know it's a it's a family guy pinball table it's a futurama it's the mandalorian and they're not real they're not real tables so as a result it feels like a fantasy version of of pinball in a lot of cases and i know we'll say from a physics standpoint um it doesn't always work, but you know, they've been at, they've been making pinball. Zen studio has been making pinball games for fucking for a long ass time. And uh, I know some people really like those, uh, those games. And I say, say more power to you. Like, don't let me yuck your yum. I just think that there are other, um, you know, pinball games out there that, uh, again, focus more on emulating real, you know, real world tables, uh, that, uh, interest me a lot more, but 32 employees, that's a, that's a huge loss for uh, Zen Studios, and I hope everyone lands on their feet, and I hope Zen Studios continues to make the great games that they want to make. Let's talk, uh, we've got a couple new stories. Got a couple more. Bear with me here, if you don't mind. I have even some good news stories. This new story seems all right. Netflix is reportedly interested in adding Grand Theft Auto to its games catalog. Now... I feel like nobody talks about this stuff and I never engage with it. So I'm just as guilty, but Netflix offers games. Netflix offers video games now. Um, and you can even do it from the comfort of your own phone. You can download, you know, whatever balloons, TD six classic solitaire, whatever, onto your phone through the Netflix app. They're also offering a game streaming as well. That's currently in beta. Now, according to wall street journal, 
uh, which claims the streaming giant wants to take a page out of Hollywood's playbook by licensing major third-party properties to complement its, uh, you know, first-party offerings. Um, over the next few months, Netflix subscribers will be able to play mobile games based on its hit properties, including Squid Game and Wednesday, while the company is also exploring games based on Extraction, Black Mirror, and its Sherlock Holmes series. However, even as its first-party lineup grows, Netflix will continue to offer popular third-party games like Bloons, TD6, and Classic Solitaire, and it has reportedly discussed releasing a game within the Grand Theft Auto series through a licensing deal with Rockstar owner Take-Two. Netflix began offering subscribers access to a library of mobile games. That's why I stressed you can only play these games on the Netflix app on your uh, iPhone or iPad. Um... And that happened in late 2020, uh, late 2021. However, it's also expanding into higher end games that can be streamed from TVs or PCs. It launched a cloud gaming service uh, in limited beta uh, in August. It supports two games. The first party title, Oxen Free from Night School Studio and Molehue's Gem Mining Arcade Game Mining Adventure. Players use their smartphone as a controller to play games on TV, while members can use a uh, members can also use a keyboard and mouse to play on PC and Mac. Netflix is also working on an original multi-platform AAA game at a recently established studio in California, which is led by Overwatch executive pro producer uh, Chaco Sunny. Uh, the team includes the studio's creative director Joseph Staten the Halo veteran who left Microsoft in March, and art director Raf uh, Grassetti, uh, who previously held the same position at God of War developer Santa Monica Studio. So Netflix is geared to make a big AAA game at some point in time. In the meantime, they're trying to find that balance between mobile games, uh, licensed games, original games, uh, and streaming games on PC, Mac, and so on. Now, it seems like this would be, um, when I hear this, uh, releasing a game within the Grand Theft Auto series, I'm assuming that they're going to put out, like, an old, I don't know, like, like an old GTA game, like, 5, I mean, 5 is the most recent, but it's also, Grand Theft Auto 5 is fucking old as shit at this point, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. They put out a PS5 version. It probably looks all nice and pretty. Like, are they are they going to put out, like, Grand Theft Auto 3? 4? San Andreas? Vice City? 5? Like, what? Or are they going to make, like, a new Grand Theft Auto game for Netflix? It's very weird. You know, it's kind of rumors and speculations at the moment. But, um... It adds credibility to uh, Netflix's, um you know, kind of story around focusing on games. So I hope you like paying for paying for more for Netflix. Cause soon you're going to be able to play Grand Theft Auto real quick. Uh, just cause developer avalanche is opening a new studio in California and sorry, uh, opening a new studio in Canada. Uh, the move follows the acquisition of Montreal based studio monster closet. Now what did Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I see here. Uh, Monster Closet's developers have previously worked on games including Halo Wars 2, Far Cry Primal, 2008, Prince of Persia, Assassin's Creed 4, uh, Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, and Hyperscape. Uh, they've already integrated into Avalanche, uh, Avalanche Studios' uh, three creative divisions. So the company is called Avalanche Studio Groups. And then within Avalanche Studio Groups, there's three divisions. There's Avalanche Studios, and Avalanche Studios are the Just Cause people. There's Expansive Worlds, which make the Hunter games, which the Hunter games are like hunting simulators. And then there's a Systemic Reaction, which uh, makes Second Extinction. Second Extin Extinction is going to be uh, going away soon. I believe they announced that... Um, that game is going to be shutting down in the near future. I'm assuming they're going to combine those studios, uh, Monster Closet and Systemic Reaction, to make something else. I don't know. There's There's been a while since an Avalanche uh, game has come out. Just Cause came out a few years ago. 
Uh, maybe time for Just Cause 5? I'm not too sure. But uh, the good news is, opening a new studio uh, after having bought Montreal-based studio Monster Closet. We're going to take a break. When I come back, we're going to talk shit I should have talked about last week and the games that I've been playing. So stick around. Glitch Report ain't going anywhere. Welcome back to Glitch Report. I am Nitwit. And I'm here to talk about shit I should have talked about last week. Um, this is actually, yeah, I, I really should have talked about this last week, considering it's, it's quite old news now. Remember Unity? Remember Unity and their horrible, very bad, terrible plan to charge developers more money to make games using their platform? And do you remember how the CEO, John Riccatello, sold shares in Unity prior to that controversial announcement. I'm not saying the man did insider trading. I'm just simply saying that John Riccatello sold shares in Unity prior to uh, the stock price tanking with that controversial announcement. Well, Unity CEO John Riccatello, former EA boss, has stepped down following backlash over the engine monetization plans. Um, his departure comes weeks, weeks after the company sparked a backlash from the development community by announcing controversial monetization plans for its popular game engine, which it partially walked back following the out outcry. Now, for me, a, a former IBM president, James Whitehurst, has been appointed as Unity's interim CEO and president, while, uh, 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 uh uh, their uh, lead independent director of Unity Board has been uh, appointed its new chairman. Rigatello put out a statement saying, It's been a privilege to lead Unity for nearly a decade and serve our employees, customers, developers, and partners, all of whom have been instrumental to the company's growth. I look forward to supporting Unity through its transitional uh, transition and following the company's future success. Uh, Whitehurst put out a statement saying, with the company's experienced leadership and passionate employees, I am confident that Unity will is well positioned to continue enhancing its platform, strengthening its community of customers, developers, and partners, and focusing on its growth and profitability goals. Last month, Unity announced plans to charge developers every time a game that uses its engine is installed. Starting in January 2024, the proposed Unity runtime fee would apply to games that meet a minimum revenue threshold and have passed a minimum lifetime install count. The move is widely criticized by developers, some of whom began boycotting Unity by switching off its ad products, and the company later revised its plans. Unity said it would no longer be charging per install fees uh, for those using Unity Personal or Unity Plus plans, and that fees would no longer apply to existing games. Now, you might be wondering... Why is Unity trying to charge people money for installing their game? Well, I'll tell you why. Because Unity is really big in the free-to-play mobile market. I recently downloaded a AEW game. I forget which one it was called. AEW Rise to the Top, I believe. And it's a Unity game. It's also a free-to-play mobile game that has ads in it. And uh, when you're watching these ads, you can actually click on like more info about the ad itself, not just the game that's being advertised, but you can actually click on a link that shows info about the ad itself. And Unity is the ones bringing you the ads. And I'm assuming Unity is the, is the engine that this mobile game is running on. Now, in fairness, I downloaded a free-to-play game, right? So... If the barrier to entry on this AEW free to play game is very low, that means that the developer is going to need to sell me gems and fucking, you know, rare exotic Chris Jericho, you know, character upgrades or whatever uh, in order to make its money back. Of course, it might make a little bit of money from the ads that are brought to you by Unity, but you can see where if everybody just decided to download this. AEW free-to-play mobile game. It's called AEW Rise to the Top. I'm not 
here to tell you one way or the other if it's good, but I've been playing it. Um, if everybody went out and downloaded EA, uh, sorry, uh, AEW Rise to the Top, that that developer would have to pay Unity just because people downloaded it. They might not have spent any money on it. Again, it's a free-to-play game. You can see where Unity starts to see where the money's at. The money is in free-to-play games. The money is in mobile games. And they are going to screw over developers to get that paper. Anyways, uh, John Riccatello is out of Unity. Let's talk games. I've been really floating around with games this week. I, um, I've been playing a lot of stuff here and there. I poked at Starfield a little bit. I, uh, played a little bit of, um, you know, uh, Forza Motorsport. I actually beat Gotham Knights. I've now played through Gotham Knights twice in one year, which I don't think I've ever done with any game. Played through it twice in one year, but I, I did. I, I beat Gotham Knights, which, hey, Gotham Knights is on Game Pass, so it's not like I paid for it again. And Gotham Knights is on uh, PlayStation Plus if you want to experience the magic for yourself. Um, that game's okay. Gotham Knights is an okay game. I did also fire up Marvel's Avengers and... Um, because I thought, you know, Marvel's Avengers is, you know, kind of being that action, you know, RPG similar to Gotham Knights. Um, I just don't maybe find Marvel's Avengers to be quite as engaging as Gotham Knights. I, I genuinely think Gotham Knights is a better game than, uh, than Marvel's Avengers. But hey, maybe I'll go back to it. I own Marvel's Avengers. They can pry it from my cold, dead hands. Maybe I'll go back and play it one of these days. I will say that I think, um, you know, the storytelling in Marvel's Avengers is a hell of a lot better than it is in Gotham Knights. I find graphically, uh, you know, Marvel's Avengers is a much better looking game. Uh, but I think the action in Gotham Knights might be a little bit better. I think some of the story structure, the, the, like the structure of that game in Gotham Knights is better than in, um, Marvel's Avengers. Again, Marvel's Avengers, you know, wants you to play it as an, as a, a multiplayer game. You could, 100% play through everything in Marvel's Avengers by yourself, no problem, right? You can play every single thing that uh, is available in Marvel's Avengers as a single player. You can play through the, you know, there's a whole lot of story stuff I should mention. They've put a fuck ton of story content into uh, Marvel's Avengers. You have the main story, which is what launched with the game. And then there's like three or four other stories, uh, stories to play through, uh, you know, featuring... Um, Black Panther feature, uh, featuring uh, Hawkeye and, and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, if you can get behind the way that um, Marvel's Avengers is kind of structured and presents a lot of its content, um, there's probably some fun to be had. But uh, again, it's, it's, it, this is really an apples to oranges comparison. So don't like, don't assume that just because I liked uh, Gotham Knights that I would be incapable of liking Marvel's Avengers. That if you like Marvel's Avengers, you wouldn't like Gotham Knights or whatever. It's apples and oranges, but those are two recent games that I played, so I'll compare them. Again, I need to probably go back to Starfield and clean up a lot of the side quests and, and side content that I've been playing. Though I do find myself being like, yeah, I beat Starfield. I'm 100 plus hours into that game. How much more of it do I really want to play, even though I haven't seen all of the side uh, missions and, and some of the big story content I, I still haven't even seen? Um, for the most part, but I'll probably go back to it. Um, my, uh, racing wheel, racing wheel update. My racing wheel is sitting under me. Uh, I, I, I kick it sometimes and I'm like, you fucking thing getting in my way. But anyways, uh, maybe I'll hook it back up and, and do some more racing in, uh, Forza, Forza Motorsport. We'll see. But really my, my time this week has been spent playing old video games. I know new video games are coming out left, right, and center, but I decided it's time to fire up the PlayStation one and PlayStation two games and play a bunch of those. So, um, when I first fired up these, uh, PlayStation one games, uh, I started with twisted metal. I don't know why I just, I was like, ah, I, I like twisted metal too. Or at least I thought I liked twisted metal too. Here's the thing. I think the idea of putting guns and missiles and flamethrowers and rocket launchers on cars is a beautiful idea. I'm for it. I love it. Do it. I'm happy for you. However, the execution 
of par combat games is I mean it is aged like milk. I hate to say this because I totally thought I was going to enjoy playing it after firing it up. Twisted Metal 2 plays like absolute dog shit in the in, in the year of our Lord 2023. It is a nightmare of a game to play. And, I, and I'll, I'll explain. I'll, I'll try to explain. I, you know what? I didn't play. There was a PS3 Twisted Metal game. Maybe that game's aged a little bit better. And I didn't play Twisted Metal Black, which is the PS2 game. But I did play uh, Twisted Metal 2. And I did play Twisted Metal 3. I think I played 3 as well. The problem with car combat is that your car really only moves forwards or backwards and in order to turn left or right you need to turn as if you were driving an actual car which means that if someone is t-boning you with missiles and rocket launchers and machine gun fire you have very little uh in the way of uh you know countermeasures when it comes to firing back at that opponent Right? You have to back up, then turn around, then aim at him, and then shoot, and then, you know, find a way to engage with them either from the front or the back so that the car lines up with the other car to shoot them. It ends up being like the worst dog fighting experience you could possibly imagine. You're just spinning around in circles. Or you're getting caught by someone, you know, that's getting you from your blind side or T-boning you or whatever. And then you have no, and then basically you just run away. You just drive away and then hope you find them somewhere else in the level uh, to shoot them. It fucking stinks. It stinks. And I used to love Twisted Metal, man. Love Twisted Metal 2. I thought Twisted Metal 2 was pretty good. I thought Twisted Metal 4 was okay. There was a little too much Rob Zombie in uh, in Twisted Metal 3 and 4 for my taste. There's a lot of Rob Zombie in those games for whatever reason. I thought Twisted Metal Black was fucking awesome. Uh, and I thought that PS3 game was not bad. But going back to Twisted Metal 2 now in 2023, whew, um, a stinker. A real stinker. I mean, I'm not even going to get into the part where, where where it's an old looking game, where the graphics, whatever, the level design, whatever. I'm talking just pure gameplay, right? Pure gameplay. Uh, it is a it is a nightmare on wheels to play. It really, really is. That being said, you know, some of the games that I've spent the the most time playing, uh, the probably the the old game that I've spent the most time playing is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. And Castlevania Symphony of the Night is a game that I try to play once a year every year because I love that game. In fact, I like that game so much that um, I might work on a New Year's resolution for uh, 2024 and finally come up with a top 10 favorite games of all time list because... I think Castle, like, I'm not even the biggest Castlevania fan, you know, when it comes to the other games. Like, I don't necessarily care for, like, you know, nin old Nintendo Castlevania. I certainly don't care for Lords of the Shadow, whatever the fuck that game's called for PS3. Um, I, I don't, I didn't play the mobile games. I don't care about Bloodlines or Dracula X or Rondo of Blood or you know, the PS2 Castlevania games. Like, to me, Castlevania start and stops with Symphony of the Night. Which, if you're familiar with the game, you'll probably say, well, duh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night is probably the best Castlevania game. And, and that's fine. That You know, it's fine to like the, 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 best, the best of a thing. But, um, the music is stuck in my head, has been stuck in my head for 20 years now. Like, that, that, that music is stuck in my head. The, the voice acting, you know, it is terrible. It was bad then. It's, it's, it's even worse now. Um, but that music has been stuck in my head for the last 20 years. Um, I think, you know, I think about that game more than I 
probably should. And, and that's why I'm really happy to, to be playing through it now. Um, you know, uh, on the PS one. Now I actually looked it up because I was like, well, if people don't have a PlayStation one, how are they going to play Castlevania symphony of the night? Like where does, uh, where does one go? Uh, c considering uh, Castlevania is a Konami game. Where would one go to play Castlevania Symphony of the Night? And uh, I believe that there's actually a PS4 uh, version of that game. Would you look at that? Oh, wow. That's on, and it's on sale too. Okay. So uh, listen, I, again, I believe that Symphony of the Night is, is not only the best Castlevania game of all time, but it is also my favorite game one of my favorite games of all time. And, and, and if you are interested in playing it, there is a PS4 version of it. Um, it is bundled with Rondo of blood, a uh, Rondo of blood. It kind of has its story related, but it doesn't really matter. Um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, that'll of course play on your PlayStation five and, uh, it's on, uh, it's, it's 20, it's regular 27 bucks on, uh, on PlayStation. Um, However, it is on sale for $6 and 74 cents. And that's going to be on sale for, uh, for a while, which is, which is kind of neat. It's going to be on sale until, uh, November, which is uh fucking rad. Um, I'd love to get the trophies in, uh, Castlevania symphony of the night, but I'm playing the PS one version. Anyways, I don't know if they did a lot to, uh, that game. I bet they probably just bundled those two games together and slapped a price on it and said, go with God. But, um, yeah, man, you know, just exploring the castle, the combat, the, the abilities, um, and, it, and it's such an influential game. And I think the thing with influential games like uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night is that some influential games become harder to go back to the more and more other games evolve that formula. So let me put it to you this way. I love Batman Arkham Asylum. Batman Arkham Asylum probably wouldn't exist without Castlevania Symphony of the Night because you're basically doing the same things in Symphony of the Night as you are in Arkham Asylum, right? In Arkham Asylum, you enter an area, you realize that you don't have the tool or the ability to access that area, but if you continue playing the story and you continue playing through some of the side, you know, uh, collectibles and, and things like that in the environment, you'll eventually get an ability that will allow you to go back to previously unexplored areas and find the secrets and the hidden stuff in there. You know, Batman Arkham Asylum does that control does that. Um, but really a lot of that stuff started with, with Castlevania Symphony of the Night and it's still good. Like I, you know, am barely, uh, in tuned with the environments of that game, with the level design, with the, uh, the, the maps, with the, the way that castle is laid out. And, uh, I don't know every secret. I pr probably never a hundred percent of that game, but I've probably played through it at least two or three times. Um, and I'm going to play through it again. Uh, maybe just kind of on my own time, you know, off, off the clock sort of thing. And, you know, give myself time to cover new games in, in, as well. But, um, it's a great game. I also love Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which again, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is, you know, very evocative of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. But, um, yeah, I, I maybe I'm only going to, I might not get into other PS1 games. I might just play Castlevania Symphony of the Night, but, uh, uh, we shall see. And speaking of games, we shall see uh, City Skylines is out next week. That is out on Tuesday, the 24th reviews for the game have been a little rough. Uh, but I'm not going to do a review roundup the way I did for Spider-Man and for, uh, you know, Mario wonder. I'm going to play that game myself and I will tell you all about it, uh, to the best of my ability, uh, next week on the show, but, uh, I'm going to keep playing Castlevania in the meantime, and that's going to do for the podcast. I have been nitwit. You can find everything that I do over at my link tree, linktree.com slash nitwit G N I T T W I T T Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, all of that good stuff. We'll probably make a video uh, soon. Videos have done really well. I, you know what? In general, like I got to just between you and me, 
I got to keep making more videos, especially videos for YouTube and videos for um, like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube shorts and Facebook and stuff like that, because the videos are far and away the most popular content that I produce. And I say that uh, because I thank you for, for listening to the podcast. Um, podcast is one of my favorite things that I do every week without fail. Um, and my hope is that if I continue to produce uh, videos that uh, this podcast can grow uh, to be as popular as some of those videos. I look at subscriber numbers. I look at uh, viewership and listener numbers every day because I'm sick in the head that way. And I would love to uh, produce content that eventually grows uh, this uh, this podcast. And the and the best way for me to do that uh, is to uh, keep making you know uh, YouTube videos. So subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Check out some of the stuff on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, stuff like that. And uh, I'll let you get to that. And I will see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Take it easy. We'll see you next time.